Hello and welcome to this Top Down Engine video. I'm Renault from Mountains, and today we're going to have a look at some of the new stuff that made its way into the Top Down Engine since version 2.0 and 2.1 uh, released a few weeks back now. So if you go to uh, the engine's website on the releases page, you'll find uh, the full change log of version 2.1 and 2.0. As you can see, there's quite a lot of new stuff also bug fixes uh, and improvements across the board as usual. And if you uh, scroll a bit more, you'll find this timeline of all the updates uh, for all assets. The top down engine are the green labels. You can see it's still uh, getting quite a lot of updates and uh, rest assured there is much more planned uh, for the coming weeks and months. Um, so a lot of new stuff. I won't be covering everything today. It's also not a tutorial video. It's more of a tour of the new features. Uh, of course, when it makes sense, I'll show you how to set up uh, some of the new stuff. But uh, if you want detailed info, uh, every new feature and actually every feature is covered in the documentation. Uh, we'll be talking today maybe about the, uh, the loot system. Uh, you can see it's all detailed here, everything is in the documentation. Uh, if you don't find the info, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to me via the support form, uh, which is right here. That's the thing. And uh, there's also a Discord server with extremely helpful people uh, that hopefully will be able to answer your questions or help you solve your issues. So yeah, let's get started. So the first thing I want to show you is a new ability uh, that got us added in, in 2.0 and it's the one that got requested the most. So when I created the top down engine, it was uh, of course designed to handle purely uh, top down action games. Uh, think of uh, Binding of Isaac or uh, Hotline Miami, Hell Divers, stuff like that. So uh, typically stuff where the camera is more or less static um, or at least its angle is static. And uh, people wanted to be able to rotate the camera. So uh, maybe you want to make a isometric game. Maybe you want to do uh, a game where the camera rotates. So now, now you can. Um, if you open the Loft 3D demo, uh, you'll find that when you press L and M on your keyboard, uh, you can rotate the camera left and right. So this is all thanks to a new ability. Uh, if I select my character Loft Suspenders here, uh, you can see I have a bunch of abilities and one of them is called Character Rotate Camera. And that's pretty much all you need to uh, rotate the camera in your scene. So uh, you can define whether or not it should rotate in a world or local space. So if you have like a camera rig like I do in that scene, uh, that may have an impact. You can define what uh, the camera should consider as forward and you can change its rotation axis. So for example, if I uh, make it now rotate on the x-axis and uh, try to rotate the camera. You can see I get this uh, interesting angle, still sort of playable and, and somehow, somehow not such a bad idea, actually. Ah, there, there, might, there might be a good idea uh, for something different here. Actually works. Wow. That's, that's, that's my idea for my next game. The vomit inducing cam. So um, yeah, you can uh, of course you know change these values at runtime for most of them. It's actually not too bad. Wow, I wasn't I wasn't expecting that. Um, you can change the uh, camera rotation speed, so it was it was fairly fast. Uh, this might be better. You can change the interpolation speed, so you can you can have uh, something where it feels much more tight, you know, like when you stop or extremely slow uh, to stop where, you know, like, yeah, I release now, you know, you get a lot more inertia uh, to your camera. So you, this, this is how you, you tweak the thing. Of course, uh, ability start and stop feedbacks and sounds are not really relevant to that ability, not as much as they are for others, but uh, the blocking movement states and conditions should work, uh, well, do work actually. And uh, the cool thing is you can also, of course, pilot that, that ability from anywhere. So if you want to, uh, I don't know, trigger a rotation of the camera, not by input as the ability does right now, but just via, via script, you can also do that, of course. 
So the next thing I want to show you uh, can be seen in the colonel demo I am in right now. And you can see I'm playing with the uh, left hand on the keyboard right now, not using my right hand. And you can see it's auto aiming. So that's a feature that was already in. But now we have these nice aim markers uh, that help tell the player, you know, you're aiming at this or that. And you can see they are animated. Uh, you can see that they will uh, auto move if the character changes. They also have these nice uh, emission changes when they swap uh, targets. And so the way it works is uh, fairly simple. So if I select my colonel here and uh, look at his abilities, you can see I have a character handle weapon, which has an initial weapon. If I click on the initial weapon, it selects it for me in the project. And here I have a bunch of uh, components, hit scan, that's what handles the, the logic of the weapons um, and that weapon and applies the damage and, and does the ray cast and everything. Um, weapon aim lets me aim the weapon and weapon auto aim lets me override that aim, pilot it via a sort of uh, mini AI that detects targets and, and applies that. And you can see here, I have this aim marker prefab which points me at that colonel aim marker. And you can see it's a simple object. Uh, it's got this sort of uh, sprite and an aim marker script. On the aim marker script, I can define whether or not I want that marker to uh, sort of teleport from target to target or interpolate its position, uh, in which case I can define the duration it takes to go from uh, target A to B, uh, the curve it will uh, move on and a, an optional D-Day. I can also assign feedbacks to um, state changes. So uh, if I'm finding a first target, uh, in this case, I'll be playing this MM feedback with um, a scale and a sound, but I can also hook feedbacks to uh, a new target being assigned or not having uh, targets anymore. And uh, yeah, that, that's how the uh, aim marker works. While we are in that demo, uh, there's something else I wanted to show you. So if I uh, grab my guy again, uh, you can see that now I can dash. And when I dash, it does this sort of round kick. It also works with the auto aim, which is nice. And that round kick applies damage, right? So this is done uh this is a new class a new ability the damage dash uh, you can see it here in the list of, of abilities um its dash mode is based on uh right now the main movement but i could change that uh it's basically a dash and the cool thing is uh it's a very simple class just uh showing you this one so that you can see uh sorry i'm trying to grab my id which is being non cooperative right now. All right, here we go. So uh, you can see that this damage dash here, it extends correct dash 3D, which is uh, an existing ability that does a lot of stuff, handles cooldowns and everything, uh, states. This one is super simple. So let's say you have an ability, maybe crouch and you want to crouch to apply damage or something. Um, as you can see here, it's done fairly simply. What I do is I declare a damage on touch area, uh, so an object with a collider uh, that will uh, apply damage to anything that uh, enters in contact with it, uh, as long as you know the, uh, the settings are uh, matching. We'll have a look at that. And in this case, what I do is I disable it on the initialization of my character. And when the dash starts, I enable it. When it stops, I disable it. Extremely simple stuff. Um, what makes it great is that uh, here you can see that I have this new uh, field target damage on touch. The rest is the basic dash. If I select it, uh, I have my damage on touch area here. I'm going to double click on it so you can see it. So that's my uh, damage area. It's in front of my character. It's going to rotate with the character as it moves. Uh, how could I do that? Yeah, OK. So. You can see that it not super easy to control, but uh, you, you can see that yeah, when I rotate the uh, the object also rotate 
it's right here now if I activate it. So um, very simple setup and just using um, animation parameters. So in this case, I, I bound my uh, dashing to this sort of round kick. Um, you can see I have this uh, any state transition here that goes uh, to this roundhouse kick animation anytime you know, anytime uh, dashing is true. So technically it's a dash. Visually for the player, it looks like a kick. Um, just a nice way to, to do maybe melee attacks if you want them to actually move your character. So that's the uh, character damage dash. For this uh, next new feature, I'm in the minimal grid 3D demo scene. Um, so the engine also supports grid-based movement. Uh, you can see that here, even if I do very little taps, I move by one grid and always one grid. Uh, even if I'm in the, in the wild, I'm working on that grid and I can't really escape it. I, I won't be able to stop my character between the two grids. And I've been uh, adding new features to the grid movement, which right now doesn't support maybe all of the features um, that the uh, you know regular movement supports, but I'm trying to make it robust and usable. I think it, it, to a point where it works really well. Uh, and one of the latest stuff I've added to it was support for teleporters. So you can see that now. If I go into uh, the orange one, I exit through the blue one, and vice versa. So just uh, yeah, trying to add more and more stuff to that. It also works in 2D, of course. Uh, it's a different script. Uh, usually the end of the script would change. Like uh, if we look at that grid character, you can see it has a uh, top-down controller 3D and you will need a control 2D, uh, but the character grid movement is unique. And, and the same for both 2D and 3D. So yeah, uh, grid movement getting some new cool features. One of the uh, new things I wanted to show you were the new actions and decisions that are available now for your AIs. And I'm gonna mute uh, audio for now. In this scene, the first enemy in that uh, corridor has the ability now to reload. So you can see uh, that enemy is shooting five bullets at me, then uh, reloading, one, two, three, four, five, reloading, and again. You know. And if we select it, uh, that's this, this little dude here, if we look at the brain, you can see that it has a number of states. One of them is reload. So it starts patrolling, then it starts to seek and destroy the enemy, goes back to patrolling. And when it's destroying, uh, you can see it's uh, um, making sure that we still have a line of sight to the target, but it also looks at whether or not a reload is needed. And if it's true, then we go to the reload state, which as you can expect, performs a reload. And uh, after a certain time in state, goes back to patrolling. So that's that's what it's doing. Um, but as you could see, there's no animation uh, for reloading right now. I could have one, I could add one if I had one. Uh, I don't have one right now, but uh, let's see what we could do to, to make it more clear that the enemy is reloading. So uh, I think we're gonna try and play a sound. Right now there's no sound when, when reloading. Uh, to do that, we can uh, select or ability, character handle weapon, click here, select the initial weapon, and this is this, uh, this weapon here. If we open it, we can see we have a shoot feedback that does actually quite a lot of stuff, particles, uh, bloom, vignette, and so on. We want to create a reload feedback that we're, we're gonna play every time or uh, character reloads. So I'm gonna create a new empty object uh, under my weapon and call it uh, reload feedback. I'm gonna add a MM feedbacks script to it. And I'm just gonna go with some audio. Uh, again, I don't have an animation, but if I had, it would be done just like for any other weapon. Um, and I'm gonna go with some of the new stuff here. You can see we have these uh, MM sound manager options and they are the now recommended way of playing sounds. Uh, the biggest advantage you'll get out of that will be a ton of options to control your sounds. You'll be able to play them on different tracks um, and you'll be also able to automatically manage your memory. Uh, the system 
recycles audio sources. It's it's uh, just it's a good way to play sounds. If you're interested, uh, there is an, another tutorial on YouTube uh, and an entire uh, documentation for that on uh, the field documentation. I'll mention it again uh, towards the end of that video. I think. So um, going back to our reload. So I added a MM Sound Manager sound. This lets me play sounds. I'm going to pick a sound. And I'm uh, going to look for some reload sound. I have one here, Chrono Reload. And I'm going to test it. Sounds like a good reload sound. Um, what else could I do without an animation? Not too much, right? So let's stick with that sound. It's not much, but it's a start. And uh, on my weapon here, if I unfold the feedback section, you can see I have a weapon reload MM feedback. I'm just going to drag and drop this one here. I, I can then uh, save my prefab, go back to my scene, press play and see how it goes. So now we hear the reload sound, but the reload takes a while, um, maybe too long compared to the duration of the sound. So we could either you know, fix the sound and make it longer, um, or we could fix the weapon. I'm going to go and fix the weapon itself. Um, reload time is two seconds. I would go with maybe one and see how it goes. might still be too long but you know that's that's how you would tweak it and that's how you would uh end up um getting better get a getting better feedbacks on on your weapons so yeah um other new ai actions and decisions uh introduced in 2.0 include some of some stuff like um actions to move away from a target um what else was new you find the list um, in the release notes. I could have prepared that more. Uh, this is very much improvised. Um, yeah, new uh, AI decision reload, AI action reload, and move away from target. Better options to AI action shoot two D. Um, more options to uh, reset brains when you swap AI brains, so stuff like that. Uh, AI is getting better across the board and also a lot of uh, improvements in terms of performance. So uh, you should find that in 2.0 and going forward, uh, it's less taxing in terms of performance and it gives you also more uh, granular control, uh, via especially the um, frequencies here. So this uh, zero is extremely uh, frequent changes, but if you have a lot of actions, a lot of decisions and a lot of AIs, uh, you may want to make sure that they only maybe refresh once a second uh, or every second, I mean. So yeah, better AIs. While we are in that scene and on that character, uh, one of the new features of version 2.0 was the loot system. So if I select this character, you can see it has a loot script attached to it. If I press play, and this time get aggressive, I'm gonna mute the sound just so I can talk. Um, as you can see, I killed that character and a box appeared. Uh, in this case, it's ammo for my gun, I think. Or is it? No, it's another gun. Cool, I have two guns now. Um, but this, this, happened because of that loot script here. So what this does is it's a loot system uh, designed for loot, designed for spawning rewards after you destroy something, usually. Uh, but eventually, it's a spawner system. So you could use it to spawn VFX. You could use it to spawn um, sounds even, you know, like anything you want, any objects. Uh, and 
in the top-down engine, it will be bound to conditions like on death, on damage, um, but technically you could uh, also trigger it however you want. So uh, let's have a look at what it does and how it works. So uh, the first thing is you have a loot mode. Uh, it can be unique loot table or uh, loot table scripted object. So unique, you will spawn only one object, always the same. Loot table, you will define a loot table on that object. And loot table scriptable object, you will define a loot table exactly the same way, but on a scriptable object. So that means you can assign the same settings to more than one um, loot. So um, I'm going to go with the uh, scriptable object version and let's have a look at what a loot table is. So it's a list of objects that have a chance to spawn and their chance is determined by the weight. So the weights you can see are uh, the steam pack has a weight of four. This um, assault rifle has a weight of two and so on. These weights, they don't have to add up to anything. They are related to each other. So if uh, this steam pack has a weight of four, it has twice as much chance to spawn as this one that has a chance of two. And you can see that the system also uh, generates percentages for you. The cool thing is you don't have to make sure, yeah, it all add up, adds up to 100. You can work with whatever scale you want. Um, Going back to our, um, sorry, going back to our loot. So here we bound that script of object that's done. That's a, a drag and drop like that. Uh, if I had 20 objects in that scene and I wanted all of them to have the same chances to spawn coins and steam packs and whatnot, I would use the same script of object. I could have more than one script of object and maybe have um, one for enemies and one for furniture. Uh, it's entirely up to you. Again, the option is yours. You can set it using scripted objects. If you if you plan on reusing that loot table on more than one, if they are if your loot tables are unique, uh, you can use the direct uh, sort of embedding the loot table in the prefab itself. Then we have the conditions. So in this case, I'm going to be spawning the loot on death. So if I killed this object, uh, the health component here is going to tell the loot, you know, uh, well, it's it's even based, but you get the idea. Uh, it's going to say, hey, this object is dead, spawn something. I could do it on damage, uh, which would be fun. Let's do that. Going to be more rewarding, for sure. Um, I'm going to go and try to shoot that dude. You can see that, yeah, every time I shoot the dude, something uh, drops. And... Uh, if I want to make it more rewarding, I can also change the quantity. So right now I'm spawning a maximum amount of one, but I could say I want something between 50 and 100 objects. Uh, plus doing that on damage, hmm, that's going to be that's going to be a lot of stuff. Going to feel like Christmas. So you can see that uh, I get a lot of rewards. And uh, the nice thing is, it's not even colliding with the walls. That's also one of the perks of that system. Just gonna go and try to collect all of that. And my computer survived. I think the rest I can't collect because uh, my inventory must be full right now. Yeah, I just grabbed too much stuff. But, you know, it works. Um, so going back to our regular quantities, um, here we have our spawn properties. I'm gonna go back to that in a second. So yeah, the conditions uh, on death, on damage, they are uh, the most common ones. But let's say you would like to have different conditions. Uh, the system lets you do that. So uh, the loot class uh, can look complex. It is fairly complex. But uh, all you have to care about if you want to trigger new loot uh, in different ways is it's got this public method called spawn loot. And that's all you need to know. You can call that from anywhere on any conditions that you want. So you could uh, decide that you want to spawn stuff once the uh, health of that enemy goes below 50%. Well, you just create a new class that has a reference to the health and is going to monitor the health and has a reference to the loot. When the health goes below X, you call uh, spawn loot on that loot script and that's going to spawn the thing. Um, so uh, we also have options here to avoid obstacles. Uh, so that's why, you know, we had this sort of uh, semicircle, but it wasn't spawning inside the walls at uh, places where we wouldn't have been able to collect or loot. 
uh, which wouldn't have been ideal. So here I'm saying I'm working in 3D. I want to avoid obstacles and doors. And I want to make sure they're not too close. And uh, here I can define the maximum amount of attempts. So the way it works uh, really under the hood is uh, imagine the system is looking at the map like this from above. Uh, let's say we destroy this, um, this plant here. It's going to start casting rays from above, uh, like let's say rain. And every time it, it does a ray, if it hits a wall, it's going to pick a random point within our spawn zone. And maybe it's going to go here and it's good, but maybe it's going to be unlucky and hit the wall many times. That's the maximum amount of attempts it's going to go uh, and try to pick something else. So that's, that's your way of fighting the randomness a bit. Uh, you can also assign a feedback to every time something uh, gets looted. So it could be, I don't know, if you're working on a chest, it could be the sound of opening the chest. It's up to you. And finally, we have the um, gizmos. So if I enable the gizmos, you can see here, I'm uh, working on that, that character. I see gizmos that are going to show um, the zone in which stuff will spawn. So in that case, it's ignoring uh, obstacles. It's really just uh, the obstacles are like a second pass after the, the first one. And this is controlled by the, the spawn properties. So here I have a shape. You can see I can change it from a sphere to a cube. So that's the base um, shape I'm going to work with. And I can uh, rotate that shape. I can decide on a minimum and max radius. So the object has a chance to spawn between that min and max. I can define a random offset as well. So that's really uh, an offset on, on the normal. Of, so in this case, it's uh, purely vertical, but you can see that if I rotate it, it's really the normal of my uh, disk really. And I can also uh, do something fun where, let's say I, I have this sort of shape like that. I'm going to increase the amount of gizmos to 10,000. So that's increasing the density of it. Uh, and you can see I have this sort of uh, cylinder, empty cylinder like that. I can also use a curve, an animation curve to sort of sculpt the profile of my Okay, so the, the scale of this thing, of this curve is not ideal. I'm just gonna close it, reopen. Yeah, that should be better. So you can see that by moving that curve, I'm impacting uh, the shape of my object. So uh, you, have to, you have to sort of uh, mentally rotate the curve 90 degrees, but you can see I have extremely fine control over the shape of my, uh, my loot. So um, this is, of course, extremely uh, advanced. I honestly don't know of many games that have a need for stuff like that, but that's only if you think about loot. If you start thinking about other stuff, uh, like using that as a regular spawner system, then it becomes fun. Um, did I put too much effort into the customization of that loot system? Maybe. Um, is it cool? Yeah, I think it is. So uh, you can also yeah, define uh, random rotations. So for example, 60 like that. Uh, that's going to give you more options to the rotation of your objects. Likewise, you can change uh, the scale and have something random between these values. So um, that's pretty much it for the loot system. A lot of options to uh, define the area in which objects are going to spawn. Uh, maybe we can just do one thing and, and give it a try uh, with, I don't know, a thousand objects. If I press play. I'm going to go and shoot at that poor dude. Oh, now it's on death, right? Ooh. Yeah, so a thousand uh, takes a toll on performance, but, <laughs> but it, it still works. Uh, maybe go with less objects and less expensive ones if you plan on spawning a hundred. That, that was like uh, a thousand audio sources being instanced 
instantiated at the same frame, not my best idea, but you can see uh, it still works, right? So yeah, that's it for the loot system. So we've seen how to set up loot, uh, and you know, a common form of loot in games would be coins. Um, and wouldn't it be nice if the coins, we didn't even have to get too close to them to grab them, but they would just fly to us. Well, you're in luck. I'm in the uh, minimal sandbox 3D demo scene right now. And as you can see, uh, every time I get close to the coins, they are sort of uh, magnetically attracted to me and they just fly to me. So um, there's a script for them now uh, brought to you in version 2.0. And if we select all coins uh, and have a look at yeah, the coins, you can see we have two types of coins in the scene. The regular ones, they just uh, auto-rotate like very sad coins. And we have the magnetic ones, which actually uh, hold a regular sad coin, but make it really awesome by being magnetic. So um, a magnetic coin, what is it? It's a uh, collider set to trigger. And this will define the radius, the zone in which um, a target can start attracting it. So that's like the, the magnetic field of the coin or the object really it doesn't have to be a coin, it can be anything. Um, and we have this magnetic script. So what it does is it's going to look for a certain uh, target layer mask. So in this case, only the player enemies could go past that coin and wouldn't attract them. Only the player is like... Um, um, attracting them and we want to start the magnet on enter but we could decide to also stop it on exit so uh, a character that starts going in and then quickly exits the, the coin would start moving but then would stop in this case I don't want it to stop on exit I want the coin to start chasing me uh, forever and we have a magnetic type ID um, which I actually forgot what it does, but thankfully we have two tips. Uh, so it's a unique ID for this type of magnetic object, and it can be used by a magnetic enabler to target only that specific ID. So um, this system also works with a magnetic enabler. It's something you could put on the player. And in this case, the magnetic enabler would work like the opposite. It would start attracting magnetic objects. So it's, it's the other way around. In this case, this object is autonomous and it's gonna go to any um, object in that target layer mask. I wanted to, of course, uh, uh, follow the position of the target, but I could disable it like that. And I wanted to interpolate its position, not teleport, and I can define the speed and the acceleration. And the cool thing is, uh, if I want to change the radius at which this object starts uh, magneting, um, and if I make it slower, not sure of my numbers at all. We'll see if it works. But look at the coin. Oh, all right. It's still way too fast. Um, let's make it very slow. Um, point three, maybe. I want to raise a coin, basically. What I'm trying to go for. It's still super fast. How come? Um, Aha, now we are fighting. All right, so I've been cursed uh, with the curse of the crazy coin. And if I ever stop, you know, it's, uh, it's, it follows, uh, but with a coin. It was a great movie. Boom, I died. All right, so uh, yeah, uh, good addition to the loot system, I think. Uh, you can, of course, combine both, you know, if you, if you, if you put into the loot system objects that are magnetic, well, they just uh, spawn on death or damage, and uh, players will be able to auto grab them by just moving close to them. So with top-down games, it's always an invitation to procedural generation. Generating dungeons is fun. Um, it's a good match, a good fit for that genre of games, and. Right now, there, and up until version 2.0, there wasn't any example of that in the engine. It was possible, of course, um, but there wasn't an example you could look at. 
and that changed with 2.0. I am in the uh, Koala procedural timelap demo scene. And if you look at uh, it managers here, you have this timelap level generator. And when you press generate, it generates new levels. Not only does it generate levels, but it also uh, positions an exit and a spawn at positions uh, where th that makes sense. You know, like uh, you, you don't get the exit in the middle of a wall or stuff like that. Uh, and it's already playable. So it's a complex system um, and it doesn't mean to be uh, the one you should use in your game. It's an example. You can, you can use it. Of course, it's fully functional. It's uh, efficient. It's, uh, it's fun to use, I think. But um, it's just one of the many, many ways you can do procedural generation in your game. And I would say that this one at best should be a stepping stone. Um, but what it, would, uh, what it would be useful for is it's going to show you uh, how you can do it in terms of logic, in terms of uh, interacting with the systems of the top-down engine. And it's not much. It's fairly easy. So uh, in this case, I have this time map level generator. I'm going to close the other ones. There we go. Uh, you can see it inherits from a more generic time map generator class that is in MM Tools. And um, this one would just sort of interfere with uh, the engine. So you can see uh, here we have an initial spawn that we're going to move, uh, an exit that we're going to move. And we also define a minimum distance between both. Uh, we don't want the system being completely random. Uh, it could well generate an exit on top of the entry. And you know now it's portal and uh, it's a very different game. So uh, what's important is that we want our generation to happen on a wake. Uh, the reason for that is the character instantiates on start. So that's the next step in uh, Unity's initialization cycle. And we want to make sure the character has some ground to, to work on. You could also imagine a system where uh, you just have, let's say, one room ready. Uh, it's, it's up to you. You could, you could decide that you generate the other rooms at runtime and uh, only when needed. Maybe the, the character opens the door, boom, you, you create a new room behind that door. Uh, that's possible. You just want to make sure that really only constraint is that there's something when the character appears. If you were to wait 20 frames before having your ground, well, then probably your character would be folding. So that's that's not ideal. Um, you could also delay the initialization. That's just like by default. Uh, and so, yeah, what, what it does is on awake, it generates a level. And generating means uh, handling the wall shadows. Uh, so because I'm using the time maps from the Koala dungeon demo scene, I needed shadows. Uh, these. These are these shadows. That's actually a time map that sort of replicates the walls time map and offsets it and puts some opacity. It's a very um, low fee um, shadows. Uh, it places the entry and exit by selecting random available positions and it resizes the level manager. Uh, the level manager being one of the classes of the top down engine that will uh, also determine uh, camera boundaries by default, stuff like that. So that's pretty much all your system would have to do. You know, you could generate stuff by place, placing uh, prefabs, by doing very crazy things. It's entirely up to you. The rest of that system uh, is documented in the documentation as usual. Uh, you'll find it at the end of the scenes um, docs, and you can see it's fairly uh, comprehensive. Uh, what you need to know is that it's grid-based. Um, it's going to generate a grid of time maps. In this case, it's purely time maps uh, of a width between that min and max. And you can see it's always picking something between 10 and 30. Um, it's a seeded system. So that means that uh, at different levels, uh, you will find ways to um, enforce a certain seed. And what that seed does is, uh, I'm going to show you an example. So here we have this very uh, rectangular horizontal with, uh, let's say, a, a patch of, of dirt on the left. I'm going to copy that and generate more different, you know, like let's say this one, all right, is fairly different. We don't even have dirt or not much. If I paste the seed again, and stop randomizing the seed, maybe. You know, I go back to the exact 
Um, every time I'm going to uh, try to recall that, that feed, I'm going to get the exact same output. So that's really useful, especially when uh, generating maybe a dungeon. So you go from room A to B, and you want the player to also be able to go from B to A. You want to be able to um, recall the setting of room A. Because it's a seeded system, you can do that. Um, and you can also, of course, if you check randomized global seed, then it's going to just override that every time I press generate, it generates a new, a new seed entirely. Uh, there's a slow render option, which uh, was really just for show. I, I made that for uh, to, to be able to generate stuff, but uh, it, it doesn't work well because it doesn't reposition the character. But, uh, you know, it, I found it satisfying uh, to do that at runtime. And just uh, also helped with understanding how the algorithm worked and you know uh, how how it was generating stuff. I just think it looks cool. Uh, not something that you can use out of the box uh, with the engine, although uh, theoretically, hey, it's not too bad. It's not too bad. Yeah, but it it, it breaks a lot of stuff. Um, yeah, not, don't do that at runtime or, you know, expand on it, uh, but it's not something that works out of the box. Uh, generate on awake. So that being checked means that if I play that level, um, which I think I broke, must have broken something. Oh, that's, that might be the slow render. Let's try again. Okay. All right, so it's, it's working a little too well. Um, so now every time I enter the exit, so that's the yellow part here, um, I will load that same scene again. But because I have uh, generate on awake, well, every time I load the new scene, it generates a new map, which makes it feel like I'm going to always a new and different place. So one scene, infinite levels. I find it really cool. Um, what else? Yeah, so it's painting um, on a grid, a time map grid, which is this one. And as you can see, it contains a different, uh, different layers, ground, ground decoration, walls, all shadows, holes, props. And from here, I can, uh, these are some bindings that the system needs to know, you know, it needs to know where the walls are, what is the obstacles, uh, where, where to paint the wall shadows. So it's very specific stuff for my context. Um, and these are the bindings to the initial spawn and exit that the system will take and move to match the new layout. And here I have my layers and, uh, they are, you know, uh, different using different algorithms to, uh, defined here, generate method. You can see we have different different things, different methods we can use to paint stuff. And uh, for example, the walls, they are a combination of a random walk. So uh, the idea is that we uh, pick a random spot and are going to move in random directions, sort of carving a path behind us. And also a combination with a path. And a path is like an, an horizontal stuff. So if I disable the path, and just start uh, generating again. This is the result of the random walk. The random walk, the advantage it has for a top-down game is it guarantees a pass because it's like an agent moving and carving a path. Uh, you can't end up with uh, zones that wouldn't be accessible. And uh, the walk path, though, so not the random walk, but the other one, uh, I'm using you know different settings and I'm using the fusion mode combined. So it combines the two while painting on the same uh, time map. It may sound complex and uh, to be fair, it is, but it's all explained over there. So if you look at it and start playing with it, uh, you should start having fun fairly quickly. It's, it's, it's like a toy at this point. Uh, and again, something I clearly pushed way past uh, the minimum requirements uh, just because it was fun working on it. And um, yeah, to get you started, you could just uh, say, well, I'm painting walls on the walls, the walls uh, tile map that's going to generate collisions and stuff. And I want to use that wool tile. Uh, in this case, I'm using the grasslands walls, but I could also go into uh, another demo, let's say uh, Koala, find my tiles and 
hid a new tile, so let's say uh, the walls of the dungeon. I'm now painting, you know, with the uh, Koala dungeon walls. So uh, likewise, I used to have grass on the ground. I could say, no, I want uh, dark tiles like this. And I'm generating, you know, something completely different. So because the engine ships with that many tile, tile maps that you that you can use, um, it's already a fun toy, you know, it can be can be cool for a prototype. You can even use it really for your own assets. Um, yeah, fun to experiment with. So the last thing I wanted to mention today is I've recently released a new asset called Feel. Um, what is Feel, you may ask? It's a good question. Uh, it's the new version of the standalone uh, MM Feedbacks asset, which I realized the name was confusing, right? So because it wasn't just MM Feedbacks, it was MM Feedbacks and Nice Vibrations. So um, plus I just made massive improvements to it. So I decided this was a new version. It's free if you owned MM Feedbacks and what's in it. So it is, I'm on Phil's website right now. What is in Phil? We've got MM Feedbacks, we've got MM Tools, we've got Nice Vibrations and 20 demos that are unique to Phil. If you own the, to the top-down engine already, you have these two, MM Feedbacks and MM Tools. You already have, it's the same thing. Uh, the, I'm just gonna stop that video. The noise is stopping. Um, same versions of MM Feedbacks and MM Tools. Uh, the only difference might be that sometimes I will release a top-down update before a field update or vice versa. And so they may be out of sync for a few weeks. That's the only difference. Otherwise, same thing. Nice vibrations you don't have if you own a top-down engine. It's a different set uh, focused on haptics. And the 20 demos, they are unique to feel. They won't be coming to top-down engine. But uh, I get a lot of questions, you know, from people saying, oh, uh, I own the top down engine. Should I buy Phil? Do I have to buy Phil? You don't have to do anything. It's your money. You do whatever you want. Um, what I can tell you is that if you own the top down engine, there is a discount uh, to buy Phil. It should be 40 bucks by default. It's only going to be 15 because you're only paying for the stuff you don't have. Uh, you already have these two. And so if you really want 20 demos and you really want access to haptics uh, via nice vibrations, then yes, it sort of maybe makes sense to buy Phil. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, you, you can do everything that you can do in Phil, you can do in, um, except haptics, you can do in uh, the top-down engine with the stuff you already have. Um, what's cool is it comes with a brand new documentation, which entirely applies to top-down engine. So uh, you can also consider that like an extension of the top-down engine, all the concepts described here. So uh, it focuses a lot on MM feedback, but not only. Uh, there are other tools like uh, um, uh, sound managers and sequences and MM radio and a lot more that I still need to document. Uh, all of these are already in the top-down engine. So uh, you can look at that to sort of expand your possibilities. Um, and uh, I'm going to show you one example uh, of how it integrates and one of the new stuff that wasn't there before version 2.0 of the top down engine. If I go into Loft 3D, maybe. And uh, if I look at these, these dudes, uh, the blue cubes here, if I unfold one of them, you can see I have a cube damage feedback. And it uses MM feedbacks, of course, and it's using a unique feedback that is unique to the top-down engine. So this one you wouldn't find in field. Um, and it's called the top-down engine floating text. And what this does, if I press play, is if I start shooting at these cubes, I get uh, Glowing text showing me the damage done by each bullet. And if I were to change that to the rifle, you know, now it's only 10. If I were to grab like a shotgun, well, it was 30, but it is 30, yeah. 
So you, you get the um, you get the idea, of course. Um, what is unique to this feedback is it will uh, come with options to change the um, direction of the text to make it flow in, in the opposite direction where the, the damage was applied, you know, stuff like that. Uh, fairly simple to use. And again, something that is uh, at least in its base form, the floating test, they are, they are part of uh, MM feedbacks. You will find explanations on how to use them in the documentation. So yeah, just to recap, Phil, it's a new asset. Um, it's just more cool stuff coming to you if you own the top-down engine. It's coming to you for free. If you want to also buy Phil as a separate thing, um, you know, you can. Uh, I wouldn't say you have to, but you can. Um, and it's, it's clearly optional. Uh, it's, it's not something you need. Uh, it's something that may be nice to have depending on your needs, depending on your budget. Uh, don't feel, sorry for the pun, uh, don't feel like you have to buy it, you don't. Um, and, and yeah, all, all of the cool stuff that is coming to feel, uh, for the most part, will also be coming to the top-down engine. So it's, it's just, uh, just bonus uh, goodies. That's all I had to show you for uh, all the new stuff in 2.0 and 2.1. I hope you learned something new today, and I'll see you very soon in the next video.